All right, I'm just going to get things started because we're right almost to noon. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Casey Weber and I'm the educational coordinator for the Piscataquis County Soil and Water Conservation District. And today we are hosting um, Tom Schmilk from the Maine Forest Service and Alyssa Ballman from the Maine uh, Forest Ticks Survey. And I just wanted to do a couple a couple uh, meeting etiquette notes before we get started. There's quite a bit of information to cover. So first and foremost, we are recording this meeting for the purposes of being able to share the information afterwards. So if you need to leave for whatever reason, you can um, rest assured that I can share the link with you after. I am assuming there are going to be people coming in and out of the meeting as we as we get going here. Um, you, if you could please keep yourself muted, although I mean, we will welcome questions and you can unmute yourself to ask a question, but we'll have time um, after, between both presentations to ask questions again at the end. There's also a chat function. I know maybe some of you are new to the Teams, um, to, to Microsoft Teams, but at the top of your Teams uh, browser, there's a little uh, speech bubble with lines in it and that is the chat and you can ask uh, send questions in there as well and I'm going to be monitoring that throughout the webinar and I we're going to just get right on into this as like I said we have a lot of information to cover and I'm going to introduce Tom and you can take it away. Hey Casey thank you uh, and thanks for tuning in everybody uh, so like Casey mentioned I'm one of the forest entomologists for the Maine Forest Service um, one of my programs is brown tail moth. I have uh, four or five other programs, um, and there's a couple other entomologists. Some of them um, were sort of tasked with different species, and emerald ash borer is one of the ones that's tasked to one of the other entomologists, but it's um, also a species that I'll be covering uh, later in the presentation. Uh, but we'll start off with brown tail moth. So brown tail moth is an invasive species originally from Europe. Um, and it was likely brought over here into Somerville, Massachusetts around 1897. Um, and it's been established in Maine since 1904, so by no means a, a new pest. Um, it's also related to fungi moth, which is uh, the new preferred common name for gypsy moth. Um, and that will come into play in a little bit. Uh, so this is the approximate native range of brown tail moth in Europe. As you can see, it dips down into uh, North Africa here. And the reason why this is important is because a lot of people ask me, do cold winter temperatures kill brown tail moth? And unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, so roughly around the globe, areas at the same latitude have a, the same climate with some exceptions. So um, it's coming from a latitude that's very similar to what we are here in Maine. Uh, so it's already adapted to our coldest winters uh, and our, our hottest summers. So brown tail moth is not a very picky eater, has a very wide host range, uh, but most commonly we see it in oaks, fruit trees. So that includes uh, ornamental cherries and crab apples, um, but we also see it in birch, um, elm, poplar, and our, our native uh, black cherry, uh, among others. Uh, maple is technically on the host list, but we really only see it in maple uh, when there's sort of no vacancy in the oaks, um, if they're, they're all full up. Uh, there are many uh, fuzzy caterpillars in Maine. Um, and this is just sort of how to differentiate some of them. Uh, two distinguishing features for brown tail moth caterpillars are um, these two hunter orange dots towards the tail end here. And then you can uh, see that each segment of the body is flanked by these white marks um, and no other caterpillar really has those combinations. Um, so all four of these uh, caterpillars are very common and prevalent in Maine. Uh, these two in the middle are natives. Uh, Eastern tent, which you probably see their, uh, their webs on the side of the road uh, in early, uh, late spring, early summer. Um, and then we have gypsy moth, which is now uh, known as spongy moth. Um, one of our, one of the caterpillars that gets sort of mistaken for brown tail the most. Um, and he's, he's, as you can see side by side here, um, they are pretty different looking, but they are closely related. They're in the same family. 
So he used to say that brown tail is the only caterpillar in Maine that has those two orange dots, um, but there is another one, uh, which is white marked tussock moth, as you can see here, has those two orange dots towards the tail end, um, but it sort of looks more like a toothbrush, um, and it's it's pretty distinguishable from brown tail. Like I mentioned, brown tail has been here uh, at least in Maine since 1904, so well over 100 years, um, and there were some pretty extensive control efforts that were made um, when it first started becoming a problem in the U.S. Um, so uh, brown tail is sort of unique in that it's the caterpillars spend the winter in a palm-sized winter web, and uh, back in in the early 1900s, there were extensive control efforts uh, to clip out these webs from the trees. And this photo here is a, a boy standing next to a pile of these palm-sized webs. So you can imagine how many webs are contained in this pile. Um, this is also uh, uh, all these burlap sacks are loaded with those clipped webs. Um, so like I just mentioned, winter webs were clipped and burned by the tens of thousands. Um, spray projects were initiated. So this chart here is some of the things they were spraying around 1911. Um, you can see uh, some of the stuff is uh, uh, bug death, Bordeaux lead, Bordeaux mixture, arsenate of lead. Um, some of these, uh, some of these uh, insecticides or pesticides, uh, are, most of them are no longer used just because we know the environmental impacts and the human health impacts. Um, this chemical here, arsenate of lead, is why some areas in Maine have higher incidence of bladder cancer um, because it was sort of a, a kill-all insecticide. Uh, so many people ended up cutting down their their apple trees, especially if they had an old orchard that wasn't being used. It sort of served as a reservoir for brown tail. Um, this photo here is a farm school. Uh, in addition to doing their um, every other year uh, pruning the apple trees, they would also prune out these um, winter webs. So down here, this is Somerville, Massachusetts, 1897. This is where it was first introduced. Um, and then within 17 years, uh, this light gray area is sort of the maximum extent. So within 17 years, it basically conquered southern or almost all of New England and parts of southern Canada, uh, which is a testament to how well uh, it can move and hitchhike. Um, and then in the late teens, early 20s, there was population collapses. So you can see this darker area here in 1922. Um, this is sort of when the population sort of started collapsing and retreated um, until it ended up basically just in coastal Maine and a couple of spots on Cape Cod here. Uh, so in addition to spraying and, and clipping, there were uh, two, ba two batches of uh, parasitic wasps and flies released. Um, one was for spongy moth or, or gypsy moth um, back in the 1870s when gypsy moth came on the scene. Um, and then they had another batch of these parasitic flies and wasps that were released um, in the early 1900s. Brown tail came on the scene. Um, many of them were generalists, so not only did they attack um, spongy moth and brown tail moth, but they also attacked a lot of her native species. Uh, so, like I mentioned, uh, populations uh, sort of retreated since the uh, teens and 20s until they sort of fell back to coastal Maine and, and Cape Cod, like I mentioned. Um, and like many forest pests, brown tail sort of um, moves in these outbreak cycles. So there's population booms, and busts, and we currently um, happen to be in, in one of the uh, the most recent outbreaks and one of the more severe outbreaks. So the reason why we're talking about brown tail moth is its primary problem is that it is a human health nuisance. Um, many of you know that uh, the hairs that the, cover the caterpillars can cause a rash um, and it's most common in June and July. That's when the caterpillars are out and active and shedding their skin and, and the hairs are, are more active in the environment. Uh, so the hairs are very tiny um, and they're barbed and al also hollow and filled with a toxin. So not only are you getting a mechanical irritation from the barbs in the hair, but you're also getting that chemical irritant from the toxin contained within them. Um, 
So they sort of settle out and the toxin is very stable in the environment and can last between one to three years, but that's typically in areas that don't get a whole lot of precipitation. So under your deck, boat trailer, RV, um, sort of sheltered places like that, places out, like out in the woods that get rain and snow, um, the, the hairs get incorporated into the soil and they're not really a problem. So the secondary problem is that they do cause tree damage. Um, so caterpillar feeding can cause branch dieback um, about, at about 30% defoliation. You will see some branches uh, die, um, but tree mortality usually doesn't occur just from brown tail moth. Um, in a lot of parts of Maine, there's other stressors. So um, spongy moth and winter moth are also attacking some of the same trees that brown tail is attacking. And then, um, We've sort of had a, a drought the past few years um, that really hasn't helped the trees out. So they are a little bit more stressed than typical. Okay, so uh, I'll go into some of the more common webs that you'll see in, in the trees at different times of the year in Maine and how to differentiate them from brown tail. Uh, so this is probably the most commonly confused uh, web with brown tail. Um, this is fall webworm. Fall webworm is native, um, but you can find it in apple trees and, and cherry and some of the same hosts that brown tail is, um, but also walnut trees like this, uh, um, walnut trees and ash trees, um, like this photo indicates. So the main difference here is that um, it's basically the size. So that's, that's my hand there. Um, brown tail moth webs are never going to be any bigger than the palm of your hand. Uh, as you can see, this is more football size, and that's very typical of fall webworm. Um, uh, brown tail moth webs are very tight and compact, and again, very small. Uh, so, eastern tent caterpillar, another one of our native tent building cat, uh, caterpillars. And there's a couple of, there's three main differences. Um, again, one is size. This is a very large nest, about the size of a football. Um, there's a timing difference, so you'll see these uh, large webs in late spring, early fall, or sorry, late spring, early summer, um, and then also the, the place where it's at. So these webs are going to be built basically where the branches meet the trunk. Um, brown tail moth webs are always going to be at the very tips of the branches, and again, they will be a lot smaller than these football size webs. Uh, so this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Um, so we do have uh, two species of native silk moth that um, will build a cocoon right on the, the branches of the tree. Um, typically, there, so there's a, a few different ways to, to be able to tell these native silk moths from brown tail. Um, one being sort of the color. Um, as you know, there's this bag here. Um, so this is one individual moth pupa that's inside, so it's sort of one big bag, um, and this silk that comprises the um, this case here is turns brown a lot more readily than brown tail does. Brown tail will, uh, silk will, is a little bit more tough and will sort of, um, will keep that white, shiny, silky color that you'll see in the next slide. Um, so these are sort of more neat. They don't really have a ton of leaves incorporated. Sometimes they can have a single leaf incorporated, but it's usually just one single um, bag and and again that brownish color to the silk. Okay, now brown tail webs. So like I mentioned, uh, brown tail webs are small. They're about the size of the palm of your hand. They're almost always going to be at the very tips of the branches um, and they're composed of this nice bright white silk um, sort of intermixed with leaves. It's kind of a messier nest. And if you think about it, um, there are many, many caterpillars, about 25 to 400 caterpillars per per web. Um, so it's sort of, they're all woven in here and it's sort of um, dense and, and kind of messier compared to those silk moths that we saw before. Uh, so this white silk comes uh, into play in identifying them further. Um, so this is a very common site in most of coastal Maine and, and now most of inland Maine. Uh, is that you have these large mature oak trees that um, have the webs right at the very tips of the branches. So one of the things that you can do in your own uh, on your own property 
uh, determine where brown cell is in your yard or if you even have brown cell is to go out on a nice bright sunny day just like today stand with the sun to your back and look up at the tops of the trees and you'll be able to see where all these fresh white um, webs are they'll they'll shine in the sunlight um, and it's even more apparent than than it is in these photos Uh, like I also mentioned before, there's between 25 and 400 caterpillars per web. Um, so this was a winter web that I brought in uh, a couple of years ago and just sort of let it chill out in the lab and uh, all these caterpillars emerged. So all these little brown squiggles are the caterpillars that were in this one palm sized web. Um, so if you can clip out any webs, I highly recommend you do so. Uh, typically, I have a bunch of slides about uh, detailing the life cycle, um, but this is sort of a summarized life cycle. Um, and this is also available on our website if you want to um, look at this later. Um, but typically, the takeaway home message from this is the highest ex risk exposure for the hares is between uh, mid April and um, the end of July. And that's when the caterpillars are out and active and shedding their skin, and there's a lot of hares present. Okay, so the current situation for brown tail uh, in Maine is that it has again continued is ex its expansion. This population outbreak started in 2015, um, and that that's when we first started seeing elevated numbers, and it's sort of increased every year since. Uh, the most heavily impacted counties are Anscogan, Kennebec, Knox, and Waldo, um, and that's where we're seeing the main main bulk of the population. Uh, so this past spring and summer, call activity was very, very high, um, well over 500 calls that uh, we received here at the Maine Forest Service. Um, that's not counting the ones that were fielded by our colleagues at CDC, Cooperative Extension, 211, um, and Depart uh, Bureau of Ag. Um, so high numbers and a lot of people uh, are experiencing brown tail for the first time. Uh, or are taken surprise by surprise because they don't uh, they don't know um, you know they don't realize how to to recognize the webs um, that might be in their yard. Uh, so we do two rounds of aerial survey each year, uh, one in the late spring, early summer to detect the defoliation from the mature caterpillars that are consuming the entire leaf. Um, and then we do another round of survey in uh, the late summer, early fall in order to detect the um, leaf damage from the very young caterpillars that have hatched out in August. Um, so this past year, uh, we had almost 200,000 acres of defoliation mapped. Um, that's up by almost 50,000 acres from last year. And sort of just to put this into perspective, so in the early 2000s, uh, that last outbreak that we had, we mapped around 10,000 to 15,000 acres total. Uh, so this is quite quite a large increase compared to that last outbreak. Uh, during the aerial survey, this is sort of what we are looking at from the air, and this is the the uh, late spring, uh, early summer defoliation. You can see here in these light brown patches. These are stands of oak trees that have been completely defoliated. As you can see, um, this is out around by Camden. Uh, this is the ocean here. This is the fog bank over the ocean. Um, and this defoliation uh, sort of went up into the Camden Hills and was, was very, very widespread. Um, so some good news. So there are two pathogens that um, are associated with brown tail moth. There is a fungus called Entomophaga alecki, and then there's also a uh, baculum virus that attacks brown tail. So these two pathogens are what really drives population collapses, um, and they're typically what's always ended a population outbreak. The thing being that we need cool, wet spring weather or typical spring weather, uh, especially in May and June, in order for these pathogens to really spread and proliferate. Uh, and as you may know, for the past few years, we've had a drought. Um, we did have a, a wet spring in 2019, which really helped out the mid coast area, uh, but it wasn't quite enough to get up to the leading edge yet. Um, and the past two years uh, has been a drought. Uh, so I'm, I'm 
hoping and praying for for some normal spring weather uh, this coming spring. So out on our monitoring sites, uh, we have a lot of monitoring sites throughout the state of Maine, um, and we we did pick up the even though it was a drought, we did pick up some of these pathogens, um, which is very encouraging because they were also widespread. So we found uh, the fungus and the virus all the way up in Blue Hill, down through Belfast, Liberty, Jefferson. Um, so it, it is there. It just needs those spring, those wet conditions to spread and crash the population. Fortunately, at the scale that it is right now, uh, it might take a couple of years in a row of that normal spring rainy weather uh, to collapse the population. But we might get lucky and might see a, a region wide collapse in one year. It's sort of tough to predict. Uh, so, this is at my house. Um, and this caterpillar here hanging in a U shape, uh, that's a caterpillar that's been infected with the bacula virus. Uh, as you can see, a lot of these caterpillars ended up um, getting infected with these pathogens very late on in the season. These caterpillars are fully grown and are pupating on the side of the house. Um, so even though the pathogens were present, it wasn't really enough to, to stop them in their tracks. It was sort of late in the season. Uh, speaking of late in the season, uh, one thing we did not expect to see uh, that I was very happy to see was in September, we did have some pathogen activity. Um, and these were taken in uh, September sort of monitoring uh, the development of these very young caterpillars before they go uh, before they they go off to hibernate. Um, and we saw a bunch of dead caterpillars on the outside. Not quite sure what the pathogen was that caused these, um, but I am happy to see it. And then this photo here is uh, a tachinid fly, and this is a very large family of flies, and they're all parasitoids of different uh, different arthropod groups. So um, this one was sort of inspecting the winter web uh, for caterpillars to, to lay eggs on, which is also a very good sign. So last winter, we had two new detections. Um, so this air, red area circled here is sort of where the main bulk of the population is. Um, and these stars here show where these single uh, brown tail moth webs were found. And again, it's sort of a testament to how well the species can hitchhike rides. Um, the caterpillars are very good at hitchhiking rides, as well as um, when they pupate on cars and boat trailers and RVs. What likely happened was there were some trucks or vehicles down here spending some time, picked up some caterpillars. And while they were on their way, um, Either the caterpillars fell off or the trucks or vehicles stopped and the caterpillars also got off and sort of started these little satellite populations. Um, and remember, like 17 years from initial introduction to conquering New England, and they didn't really get there on their own. They, they are very good at hitchhiking, so definitely be wary. OK, so just some notes on management. Um, so February is officially Brown Tail Moth Awareness Month. Um, it was signed by the governor, and and uh, this is sort of an opportunity to raise awareness about this uh, uh, this really important pest, um, and sort of get people's eyes out there looking at their own trees, and um, you know, getting ready to to clip and and um, sort of take care of it if if they're able to reach them. Um, First step to management is always education, and this presentation is part of it, um, but also a lot of these outreach events that um, hopefully we're getting started in the community um, will help. So these photos here are from um, Deer Isle clipping event. I usually try to um, make it up there at least once, and a uh, really great example of community-wide effort, a lot of the uh, Island Heritage Trust and Blue Hill Heritage Trust uh, sponsor these community web clipping events and it's a good time, a lot of good laughs getting out there and uh, and clipping out this low hanging fruit. Um, really, really important, a lot of community engagement. Um, and on the uh, main Forest Service website, we do have a lot of um, we have a lot of tools and resources, uh, both for homeowners and municipalities. 
um, to answer their questions and uh, sort of get them on the right path. Uh, so each year we also do a winter web survey in which uh, during this winter web survey, we drive um, all the major roads throughout uh, the infested area in Maine, and then also some buffer to pick up range expansion and, and satellite populations. Um, so all these little dots here represent points that have been dropped, um, picking up uh, brown tail moth. So the hotter the color, the, the more webs per tree uh, there were. And, and as you can see, we cover we cover a lot of ground, a lot of miles. Um, I don't think this is even all the points that we've we've dropped, but every year. So that's currently going on right now, uh, and that it helps us predict uh, where how bad it's going to be in certain areas. OK, so like I mentioned, cold winter temperatures do not kill brown tail moth. So these very cold nights that we've been having, um, the caterpillars will be just fine. They are snug as a bug in their, their little webs. Uh, like I mentioned before all, as well, cool wet springs do kill, do crash populations. And that's due to that fungus and the virus being able to spread and proliferate. Uh, so if we mentioned that if you can reach these webs, uh, the recommendation is to use that method um, to, to get rid of them and destroy them. Um, so I realize that a lot of people have uh, brown tail and these very tall uh, oak trees that are, that are not reachable by clipping. Um, and what we want you to do is go out and uh, especially on a day like today where it's bright and sunny and go out and stand with the sun to your back and basically look where brown tail is in your yard. Um, most of these treatments, either mechanical clipping or uh, chemical treatment, are more focused on mitigating people coming into contact with the hairs. Uh, so you're going to, if money is not, uh, if money is a uh, deciding factor, like it is for most people, um, we recommend that you focus on the trees that are um, that are overhanging your house or your deck uh, in high traffic areas. Don't really worry about the trees that are further away. Um, trees can are very tolerant to foliation and, and, and will survive. Um, but yeah, just focusing on those high traffic areas is key. Um, you're going to want to destroy the webs when you do clip them. Uh, and you can eat, do that by soaking them in a bucket of soapy water overnight or burning them. Uh, both are viable methods. And clipping is recommended for many reasons. Uh, high visibility, since the leaves are off the trees, you're not having any. Uh, non-target side effects so you're getting just brown tail webs you're not really hurting anything else um, and then also the hair activity is very low so you have a very low likelihood of uh, getting any any rash um, and you're going to want to do this before mid-april um, mid-april is when the caterpillars re-emerge and start feeding again um, so you'll want to do this well before OK, as far as chemical treatment goes, um, you'll want to do this before the end of May. Uh, so again, these these chemical controls, uh, chemical options are focused on mitigating people coming into contact with hairs. So if you spray later than the end of May, um, you're killing the caterpillars, but you're not reducing your risk for hairs because there'll just be a, a lot of um, caterpillar bodies in your yard with those associated hairs. Uh, one last slide on brown tail uh, tree injections are what we get most of our questions about, especially last year. And we do have a we did uh, revise our frequently asked questions page and we added a lot of questions on tree injections. Definitely check that out. I'll put a link in the chat for that later. Um, but the most common injection uh, or active ingredient that people use is called acephate. Um, and you're going to want to time that with when the tree is moving water, which is typically around bud burst. Um, again, focusing on those trees in high traffic areas. Um, it can be done by the homeowner, but you will, and I stress this, you want to follow the word, the instructions word for word. There is a, some user error. If, um, you're not following instructions and it, 
with any pesticides, it's always good uh, to, to read those instructions a couple of times. OK, so now we'll jump into the second part of the talk, uh, emerald ash borer. And um, this sort of shows a little bit about the life cycle. Uh, so eggs are laid in the bark of the tree, and then the larva um, hatch and begin feeding on the cambium. So the cambium is that layer under the bark that is sort of the living layer of the tree. Um, so they'll feed, and so it depends on where you are um, in the country, but it can take one to two years for these larvae to develop. Um, and so when they, after they're done developing, uh, developing, they will um, sort of burrow out and be just under the bark, pupate, turn into a beetle, and then the adult will chew its way out, creating this D-shaped exit hole. Um, and then they will fly and, and seek uh, another ash tree um, and uh, another ash tree to in infest. Uh, so this is a photo taken in New York, um, but you can see the amount of the larva that are in some of these trees and what happens when the larva is feeding is it basically girdles the tree because it it, it eats that whole living layer disrupts the uh, movement of water and nutrients and effectively kills the tree from the inside out um, it was first detected in maine in 2018 uh, well, simultaneously at the furthest north in maine up in madawaska and also the furthest south in maine uh, in York County. Um, the northern population is spillover from a uh, Canadian infestation across the river. Um, and then the southern population is due to uh, spillover from the, the population in New Hampshire. Uh, so why is emerald ash borer a problem? So there are no species of ash that are tolerant against attack. So all species of ash, so that's in Maine, that's uh, white ash, green ash, and black ash are, are all susceptible to emerald ash borer. Um, and almost all attacked trees do die. And so emerald ash borer came over to the US um, and I believe they found it in the early 2000s, but it likely came over here in the 90s. Um, and there have been millions of ash trees that have died since then. Yeah, so it was initially discovered in 2002 uh, into Michigan, came over on solid wood packing materials, so pallets, and they actually went back to sort of the epicenter of where emerald ash borer first started in the US. And what they found is that it didn't take off until 2002, but it likely came over here in the early 90s and sort of um, was simmering and, and stewing, and people really didn't know what was going on. There's this uh, fungal disease of ash called ash yellows that has very similar symptoms to an emerald ash borer infested tree. And um, yeah, it basically uh, it went undetected until somebody actually went and dissected a tree and, and found this insect. Uh, Ash is very important for many industries, including furniture and flooring, uh, tool making. So if you have a shovel or an axe, it's probably an ash handle or hickory handle, but ash is very common, uh, very good for uh, handle making, sports equipment. So baseball bats, uh, almost all wooden baseball bats are made out of ash, so very important. Um, and then one of the most important aspects is the Native American basket making tradition. Um, so uh, a lot of these Native American cultures use black ash, which is the most susceptible to emerald ash borer. Um, they use it for uh, making these very intricate, very beautiful baskets. And what they do is they have this log and they basically pound the log and the fibers separate into these strips that they can use for uh, basket weaving. Um, if you haven't seen any of these uh, baskets, I highly recommend that you check it out. They they are very beautiful. Uh, so problems with emerald ash borer uh, is that the beetle is very small um, and it's difficult to detect. So I've been working in forest health for about nine years now. I've only ever seen emerald ash borer adults in the wild once. Um, that was on a very 
uh, short planted ash tree that was being uh, swarmed. So most people don't see the adults. Um, in fact, I can almost guarantee you that you will never see the adults, but you will see the damage. Um, and if you peel the bark on some of these infested trees, you will see um, larva underneath the bark. Um, so most of these detected infestations are due to human assisted movement of firewood. So <clears throat> just sort of a PSA about firewood. If uh, so all out of state firewood in Maine is illegal. Um, so you shouldn't be bringing it, but not only because emerald ash borer, but there are many, many, many forest pests that move in firewood. Everything from insects like emerald ash borer um, to fungal diseases like oak wilt. Um, so it's it's not really <laughs> it's illegal, but it's also just not a good idea to be moving firewood, um, even if it's sat and been dried for years. It can still harbor um, some of these nefarious uh, forest pests. Some of the things to look for for emerald ash borer um, is signs of woodpecker activity. This is actually how we discover uh, many new infestations. So uh, usually emerald ash borer has been in the area for a few years by the time the woodpeckers key into it, um, but they will strip the bark off a tree um, trying to get at these um, at these larvae underneath. So you can see this is an exit, uh, D-shaped exit hole from an adult emerald ash borer leaving. And this is, uh, a woodpecker that has gone in and, and removed a, lar a larva under the bark here. You can see there, here's the Emerald Ash Borer Gallery here, the Serpentine Gallery. And the reason why it's, uh, so this is called blonding when this happens. And it's uh, just simply because the, um, the inner bark is this blondish color. And when uh, the woodpeckers are searching for these larvae, they'll sort of rip off the bark and expose this blonde color. These are more extreme versions um, of blonded trees, and it can be basically from head to toe um, and pretty striking. Uh, also, thinning crowns are an example or a, a symptom of emerald ash borer attack. So, um, one of the reasons for this happening is because the larvae are feeding under the bark and girdling the tree and affecting water and nutrient transport, thus, starving the crown of energy. Uh, leading to a thin crown. Um, there's also something called epicormic shoots where the tree will push out a very uh, large flush set of leaves direct, directly from the trunk. And that's also a symptom that there's something wrong with the circulatory system of the tree. Uh, so another uh, big sign of emerald ash borer is these S-shaped serpentine galleries. So whenever you see these serpentine galleries in ash, it's almost always emerald ash borer. There's nothing else really that looks like um, these galleries, especially in ash. As you can see, they they can be pretty numerous underneath the bark, um, thus girdling the tree. Um, these larvae will feed from July through October. Um, but yeah, so these S-shaped galleries are pretty diagnostic. We do have a native species of ash borer um, in a different family of beetles. This is called Neoclitus capria. Um, and the way you can tell these galleries uh, from emerald ash borer is that they have these Y shapes and they have these dead ends. They're not serpentine and, um, and S shaped like emerald ash borer. Okay, uh, so just two more slides on, on emerald ash borer. Uh, so this is the most recent uh, quarantine map for emerald ash borer in Maine. We have seen a lot of expansion from the southern population, a lot of new detections. Um, not really a whole lot of expansion from this northern population. It's pretty much stayed um, as it is for a year or so, um, but we have had quite a lot of new detections down here. And this is just sort of just a close up of that northern um, northern quarantine zone. Uh, so one of the good things about emerald ash borer is that we do have uh, some biocontrol agents. Um, there's three different species of parasitic wasps um, that we've been releasing uh, to attack emerald ash borer. They are from the native range of emerald ash borer. 
have gone through a, U a decades long USDA process uh, to make sure that they don't harm any of our native species. Um, also, these wasps do not sting people. Uh, they do not have any interest in humans and they're very, very tiny. Um, so we have it uh, in Southern Maine. Uh, we've been doing this, this these releases of these uh, parasitoids for uh, a number of years since 2018, basically. Uh, and we have recovered all three species in in the southern region here. So we release them, um, they go out and they attack emerald ash borer, and then we um, sort of survey and monitor for them. And we have recovered uh, all three species. Um, haven't had any recovery of uh, the species up in the north, um, but I think they just need a little bit more time. Okay, and with that, I will end. Um, I'm going to stick around to the end of Alyssa's presentation. Uh, so if you have any questions, you can ask them then, or or if there's time, we can go through them now. It looks like we have a couple questions. Alyssa, do you mind if we do just like five minutes of questions with Tom, and then we'll hop right into your presentation? Is that okay oh, with sure. you? Yeah, of course. Okay. So just. Sorry, I'm going to stop sharing. All right, so if anyone has any questions, um, they can either raise their hand or come off mute. Hi, I have one question. Um, the breathing part, um, do you really burn the nest? For brown tail moth? Uh, sir, the, I missed the first part of that question. So, for brown tail moth, the breathing part of it. So, I've been told not to burn burn the nests because of if you inhale them, it's a problem. So, I I've just been putting them in soapy water. Yeah, that and that's totally fine. That's uh, perfectly acceptable. If you have like asthma or you know that you might be a little bit more sensitive to the hairs, then the soapy water method is probably going to be uh, the better option. But we, especially if, if you're burning them in like a wood stove, I wouldn't worry too much about them. But again, if, if you have respiratory issues, just take the safer route and do the, okay. the water. And then when you clip the nests now, do you just leave them on the ground or do you put them in soapy water? No, so I, I had it in the presentation, but I didn't touch on it. So you'll want to destroy um, when you clip the webs out, you'll want to destroy them. If you just leave them on the ground, the caterpillars are very good at, at um, finding food and they'll sort of climb right back up on the tree. Yeah, that's that's what I thought too. So, OK, great. Thank you. No problem. And I don't see anything. I'm just going to mention. So here we are in Piscataquis County, and none of the maps showed for either species that they are, you know, here. But from a prevent prevention standpoint, what would you say um, if you've got, you know, a home or, you know, in Piscataquis County, what would you advise us to do? Um, would you have us be monitoring for the webs here or just paying attention to what's being released for information? Yeah, so actually a little bit of both. Um, so yeah, Piscataquis, uh, Pica ooh, Piscataquis County is not um, currently uh, super infested. There are probably some populations there, but um, like I mentioned, monitoring your trees and just keeping an eye on that is um, will save you a lot of trouble. But then also keeping um, keeping an ear to what we're doing here at the Maine Forest Service. Um, every year we update these maps. Um, and sort of update the situation in Maine. And I'm hoping for your guys' sake that um, that we do have a wet spring and uh, the population crashes and you don't have to worry about it. Um, but it is something to keep in the back of your mind. All right, thank you so much, Tom. I'm gonna turn it over to, oh, unless I hear somebody who has a question. Nope. OK, um, I'm going to turn it over to Alyssa Ballman and uh, Tom's going to stay on, like he said. So if you have any other questions for Tom, he'll be at the end of the, the uh, session as well. But turn it over to Alyssa. 
All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm Melissa Ballman. I'm a research associate at the University of Maine, and I'm going to be talking today about um, some of the ticks that we have here in the state. So just real briefly, uh, this is what I'm hoping to cover today. Just the different tick species we have, what pathogens they carry, um, a little bit about tick behavior and ecology, and then I'll talk about some research that we're doing here um, in the Vector Ecology Lab, um, a project called the Maine Forest Tick Survey. And then finally, I'll wrap up with how to protect yourself against ticks here in the state. So let's just go ahead and get started talking about the different tick species and the pathogens that they carry. Now we have about 14, 15 different tick species here in um, the state of Maine. Um, the three most common ones I put up here, are, these are the ones that people are most likely to encounter and also the ones that um, may potentially transmit pathogens to people. So if we start at the list, we'll start with the most medically important one, and this is the black legged tick. Now, this is a tick that people commonly refer to as the deer tick, though the technical correct name is the black legged tick, so I'm going to call it that for the rest of the presentation. And if we look underneath this picture of the black legged tick, um, these are the different diseases that they can vector here in the state, and you can see it's a pretty long list. Um, at the top of that list is Lyme disease. So this is the tick that transmits the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, as well as anaplasmosis and babesiosis. And those are really three of the most common um, tick-borne uh, diseases here in the state. And they also are capable of transmitting a couple others, though they're a little um, less common than um, these first three. Now, <clears throat> the American dog tick is also incredibly um, commonly encountered tick here in the state. And if you were out this spring and early summer, you may have been one of the people that just realized what a huge population explosion they had this year. Um, luckily, of all the ticks that have been monitored and tested um, here in Maine, we haven't had any dog ticks that are carrying um, either tularemia or Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So we do know that this tick can transmit these uh, pathogens in other states, but thus far we have not had any of these ticks carrying them here in Maine. And then lastly, uh, we have the woodchuck tick, which is not encountered nearly as often as the black legged or the dog tick, but it is one to be aware of, um, mostly because it's capable of transmitting Powassan virus. And if you're not familiar, Powassan virus is a very serious illness. Um, luckily though, it's also a very rare virus um, here in the state and really across the country. I think Maine has had a total of something like 10 cases in the state, um, though you know we did see a few cases last year, so it is definitely something to keep an eye on. And then the rest of the ticks that we have here in Maine have very little to limited um, human impact. You know, we have other ticks like rabbit ticks, which people rarely encounter and they don't carry any pathogens. Um, and then we do have other ticks like the winter tick, which doesn't have a really big impact on human health. But of course, this is the tick that has a huge impact on our moose population and moose health. So here is a moose and in just this tiny little area, if you zoom in, you can see there's probably about a thousand ticks on this poor moose. There are a couple of ticks that we are looking out for. They're not considered established here in the state yet. The first one is um, a tick called the Lone Star Tick. Um, this is a tick that uh, used to be found just primarily south of Maine and we didn't have it up here at all. We are starting to get reports of it being um, found and popping up in southern Maine. So far, it hasn't met the criteria to be considered established here. So we'd have to have a certain number of individuals at different life stages to really um, consider it to be established. And we're not seeing it yet, though it is possible it may become established here in the future. And this tick is definitely a tick of concern because it is capable of transmitting a large number of different pathogens. And um, it is a very active hunter. And so it is a definite risk to human health. And that's something we're keeping an eye on. Um, this is also the one, if you're a big fan of eating meat, this is the one that a bite can actually cause the red meat allergy, just FYI. 
And another tick we are looking for is the Asian longhorn tick. And this one is interesting because this is an invasive species. So it was first detected in the US in New Jersey in 2017. And since then, you can see all these different colored areas or areas that um, this individual tick has been spotted across the country. So far, we don't have any um, any incidences of it here in Maine, but you can see here's the list of all the different states that it is currently being found in. So sort of primarily kind of mid-Atlantic um, and a little south of there as well. And the concerning thing is we don't know what pathogens is really capable of carrying here in the United States. We know in its home range in Asia, it does carry a number of pathogens that are detrimental to human health. Um, also, very interestingly, it doesn't need males to reproduce. So it means a single female can be introduced somewhere and it's capable of establishing a population there because you're not having to rely on, um, you know, both a male and female to be introduced. So, like I said, we haven't seen it here in Maine yet, but that is definitely one we're keeping an eye out for. Now, I want to talk a little bit about which ticks are active when in kind of a typical Maine summer. Um, so this is basically modified from the UMain extension. They put out these really great tick reports, and this is based on um, the ticks that people are sending in. And so this shows you um, a range from here in sort of late March through um, December. And we don't typically see a lot of ticks in between December and March. Though it is important to note that anytime it's above freezing and we don't have um, you know, a heavy snowpack on the ground, ticks could be active. So last year, I know we had some warm weather, uh, I want to say it was last February, and I actually found um, a barn cat that had some ticks on it. So I mean, really ticks could be active here year round, but we usually typically see them, of course, sort of late spring through the fall. So back to the graph, um, we have the black-legged tick adults, this dark blue line. And then we have the black-legged tick nymphs represented um, their activity in this pale blue line. And then the American dog ticks are this purple line. And so you can see in sort of late spring, early summer, we have a lot of black-legged tick adult activity as well as a lot of dog tick activity. And as the summer goes along and we kind of hit the sort of warmer days of summer, um, the dog tick and the adult black legged tick activity tends to drop off. And so a lot of people don't see as many ticks and they feel like this is a lower risk tick time. Um, but I do want to point out that this is when we typically see the peak um, activity for the black legged tick nymphs. So sort of around July is when um, we may not see as many ticks overall, but this is when this black legged tick nymphal stage is active. And this is important because this is a life stage that's responsible for the vast majority of human illness, um, mostly because it's capable of carrying pathogens and it's so tiny. It's about the size of a poppy seed, so it tends to go unnoticed. So even if you're not seeing a lot of ticks in sort of the July to August timeframe, um, you still need to be really careful and check yourself because these ticks that are active at this time are really tiny. And then once we get into the fall, um, anyone who spends time outside or does any hunting can probably tell you we tend to see kind of resurgence of the black legged tick adults that are out trying to get one final blood meal. So it's really important to be able to tell the difference between the black legged ticks and then your dog ticks. Um, luckily, they're quite easy to tell apart. So if we look here, we have the um, black legged ticks here on the left and then the dog ticks here on the right. And the easiest way to tell them apart is that the dog ticks have a sort of white modeling markings on their body. So the female dog ticks, um, all the white markings are kind of on the upper portion of the, her body whereas the male dog ticks kind of have streaking throughout their entire body. And if you look at the black legged tick, um, they look quite different. They kind of have this reddish brown body with a darker kind of blackish um, scutum or shield right here. And so they're pretty easy to tell apart. And that's it's good to know because you want to know um, if you find one of these ticks on yourself, um, you know, you can kind of help evaluate your own risks of, you know, maybe I was exposed to a pathogen. 
And then if we put them side by side, here we have the dog tick male on the left and a black legged tick female on the right. The dog ticks are also larger. And if we look at the nymphal stage, um, the black legged tick nymph looks very similar to the adult, only much smaller. The dog tick nymph, it's rarely encountered it's sort of strange, but we rarely find them. We mostly only find the adults, um, though it does look quite different. It has these sort of bright red spots right here on its body, which interestingly enough are actually its eye spots. They're not on their heads, they're on their backs. So anyways, that's a really good way to tell th um, these guys apart. And I love this picture. Um, the CDC put this out a number of years ago just to show you how teeny tiny those black legged tick nymphs can be. So they put five black legged tick nymphs on a poppy seed muffin, and you really have to zoom in carefully to see. Here they are right here. So you can just see how incredibly small they are and how hard um, it might be to notice them if you have one on yourself. <clears throat> Lyme disease, of course, um, is a growing problem here in the United States, um, particularly in the Midwest and New England. So if we look at this first graph, this is the number of reported Lyme disease cases in 2001. Um, you can see there's very few cases here in Maine. And then if we fast forward, not even that far in the future to 2017, um, we can see that the number of reported Lyme disease cases has increased um, substantially. And Lyme disease is transmitted, um, it's caused by a bacteria and it's transmitted by the black legged tick. And this is the most widespread vector borne disease in the US. And although about 30,000 cases are reported on average every year, it's actually thought that this number is probably closer to 300,000 actual Lyme disease cases in the US each year. And so let's focus a little bit more on Maine. Um, so we can look at some maps here and this first map shows the rate of Lyme disease um, by town. And the darker colors represent um, a higher incidence of Lyme disease, and, and this is per 100,000 people. And then if we look at it at the county level, um, again, the darker colors represent the um, higher proportion of, uh, or higher prevalence of Lyme disease. And last year, um, about half of the black legged ticks that were tested for pathogens, um, at least about half of them had were carrying at least one pathogen. And the black legged ticks are actually, they're capable of carrying more than one at a time. So they could actually be carrying, um, we do sometimes find ticks that are carrying three different pathogens that they could potentially transmit to people. Um, and the vast majority that the pathogens they were carrying were the Lyme bacteria. So if we look at tick-borne disease in Maine over time, this is a graph that shows our three most common tick-borne disease, um, Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, and babesiosis. And this is the rate of cases per 100,000 people. If we start in 2001, you can see we had a few Lyme disease cases and that's really it. Um, you know, fast forward to 2020. And although we kind of see these highs and lows, overall, the overall trend is one of <clears throat> increasing number of tick-borne disease. And I feel like this graph's a little misleading because it looks, I mean, yes, we did have a big drop off in tick-borne diseases in 2020. We also had an exceptionally low tick activity year. It was a really hot and dry summer in 2020. And so we just, people weren't encountering as many ticks. Um, I'm guessing once the 2021 data is released, it was considered a pretty active um, tick year. And I'm guessing these numbers will um, go right back up again. So don't let this, don't let this think that tick um, rate diseases are actually decreasing. So let's go a little bit into some tick biology and ecology. Um, I just want to sort of quickly give you an overview of the black legged tick life cycle, just because this is the most medically important tick that we have here in the state. So it's a two year life cycle. It's kind of cool. So let's start here. Um, the eggs hatch and then they hatch into this um, larval stage. And it's important to note that the larvae are never born with any pathogens. So the mother, if she has pathogens, she's not really transmitting them to her offspring. So when the larvae hatch out of their eggs, they're going to search out and look for their very first blood meal. And they are typically feeding on small rodents, small birds, um, small things like that. And so this is really the first opportunity that this tick might encounter and pick up a pathogen. And once it picks up that pathogen, that tick is going to have it for the rest of its life. 
So the larvae will feed and then it's going to overwinter. Basically, it's going to hang out in the leaf litter under the snowpack for the winter um, and it does just fine. And then it'll merge the following year as this nymphal stage. And this nymphal stage is going to be then looking for its second blood meal. And it feeds on a really wide variety of hosts from the smaller ones up to the larger host, including people. And this stage, like I said before, is the one that's considered the highest health risk just because it's so small, it tends to go unnoticed, but it may have already picked up a pathogen when it fed um, during its first blood meal. So then after this nymph eats its next blood meal, it's going to molt into the adult stage. The adults are going to look out for one final blood meal before they then overwinter in the leaf litter, um, and then they'll lay their eggs and start the cycle over. Now, uh, tick behavior. Um, ticks like to find their host through something called questing. So this is especially true for your um, black legged ticks um, as, as well as your dog ticks. And so what they do, they basically are walking up to the top of some low growing vegetation and they just sit there with their legs outstretched and they wait for an animal or a person to walk by. And then as they brush the tick, the tick just grabs a hold of its host and then it'll start to find a spot on the body to feed on. And so ticks don't jump. Um, they don't have legs that are capable of jumping. They're not, you know, waiting for you to walk under a tree and fall down on you. They're really quite passive a lot of the time, especially, you know, depending on the species. Um, and so it's just, you know, this is why when you're out hiking, if you can stay on the trails, that will definitely reduce your risk of tick exposure. Um, and if you think about ticks, we spend so much time talking about um, ticks on us and ticks on their hosts, but the vast majority of their life is actually spent off host. And luckily there is high mortality when they're off host. There's different fungal pathogens they're susceptible to, um, different nematodes, and then there's also predatory insects that do feed and kill on ticks or do kill ticks. So, I mean, I mean, luckily <laughs> there is uh, mortality and um, our lab in particular is, is spending more time looking at sort of off host um, conditions. And, you know, I think research is kind of going a little bit more in that direction as well to try to figure out how we can impact the ticks, not necessarily just while they're on their hosts. So I want to talk about something called a host reservoir, and this is an animal that can carry and transmit those tick-borne pathogens to ticks. <clears throat> and something really interesting about a good host reservoir is that um, it's often not impacted by the pathogen it's carrying. So for example, our most important reservoirs for Lyme disease here in the state are white-footed mouse in particular, and then chipmunks and shrews. And the Lyme bacteria has no impact on mouse survival. So it can um, get bit by a tick, it has that bacteria in its body, it goes about its life just fine. And as other ticks feed on it, it then transmits that bacteria to those new ticks. When we think about black-legged ticks, we often think about deer. Um, it's important to note, though, that deer do not transmit uh, Borrelia. This is a bacteria that causes Lyme disease. However, they are in a very important host for adults. So a single deer is capable of providing a blood meal for a large number of ticks, and especially the adults. A lot of them um, will feed on the deer. This is where the male and female will encounter each other for mating a lot of times. So just a single picture of the deer here, you can see its ears are covered in, I don't know, maybe a hundred ticks, and this is just one part of its body. Um, however, the relationship is not always super clear. It's not like if we just got rid of the deer, we would get rid of the ticks. It's not that simple, unfortunately. Um, so there's been a number of studies that have either removed the deer or put up um, deer exclusion fencing. And some of these studies show that it does have an impact on the tick population, others don't. So it's really not that clear cut. Um, however, we do have a lot of deer here in the United States, particularly in New England. Um, we have a very large population. So if you think about your own property, um, as a deer 
walks through your property, if that tick is finished feeding on the deer, it's just going to drop off. So wherever that deer happens to be walking, that's where the tick's going to drop off and that's where the tick is going to lay its eggs. Um, black legged ticks in particular, they they're not going to move around a whole lot on their own. Um, they move very little in their whole lives and they're really being spread around by animals like deer. So if you want to try to keep your property um, reduce the ticks as much as possible, it's probably a good idea not to encourage the deer to um, be walking right in the areas that you or your pets might be spending time in. Plants also um, can have an impact on tick populations as well, um, particularly invasive plants. So we know that invasive plants are actually linked to increases in ticks and tick-borne pathogens, um, particularly with barberry and honeysuckle. And this might seem a little strange, but when you think about it, invasive plants grow very densely um, and they form these really dense sort of either canopies or understories and those are great conditions for ticks and their hosts. So if you're a little mouse living in the woods, um, you would love to live in a forest like this. This is totally full of barberry because um, it has really great protection from predators. You're probably able to just crawl around and find food sources in there. And so then that's really good for the ticks because it encourages um, these rodent populations. And in addition to in being good for the host populations, it's also a really great climate for ticks. So black-legged ticks in particular like sort of um, a stable temperature and really high humidity. It really needs a high humidity to survive. And if you think about a forest, if you have sort of an open forest um, with not a whole lot of undergrowth, the humidity is going to be a lot lower and the temperature is more likely to fluctuate. Whereas if you have a forest like this with this really dense um, invasive plants, it really creates optimal um, climate for the ticks that live there. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the research we're doing in um, our vector ecology lab here at the University of Maine. We launched a community science project called the Maine Forest Tick Survey. And the purpose of this study is to try to understand this relationship between forest management and ticks and their pathogens. Um, and then ultimately the goal of this project is to develop recommendations on how people can reduce their own tick-borne disease risks through land management practices. So to accomplish this, we had about 300 volunteers over the last two years, and we trained them to scientifically collect ticks using um, active drag sampling. And what this is, it's basically where you're pulling a white piece of cloth over the low growing vegetation, um, over the leaf litter, and those ticks that are questing and sitting there waiting for a host, they'll grab onto that cloth thinking it's a host. And then the volunteers can then go and pick off the ticks off the cloth. And then they send it back to us. We identify them, test them for pathogens. Um, and then they answer a number of questions. They fill out some questionnaires about their land management history. So um, I'll go over our first year results. We're still working on um, last summer's results. But basically we saw that if there was a temper harvest any time in the last 20 years, there were significantly fewer black legged ticks in those properties. So it's really amazing. I mean, I think it makes sense if you think, oh, we just harvested this property in the last year or two. It's very, you know, it can be disruptive. Um, it can be quite a bit, a lot, a lot more sunlight in. It can kind of tramp down a lot of the um, understory vegetation. But even 19 years after a timber harvest, we still saw a reduction in the black legged tick um, population. So it does have a pretty large um, long impact, which is great. There's also a really strong correlation between properties that had invasive plants and ticks. So here we look at the number of black legged ticks per collection per person and whether or not they had um, invasive plants on their properties. And you can see that the properties that had these invasive plants had significantly more black legged ticks. And this was especially true for barberry and honeysuckle. So if you have invasive plants in your forest, that's just kind of one more reason to consider trying to manage them to maybe potentially reduce your tick population. So I just want to finish up with some really brief tick prevention um, methods. 
So, of course, like I said, ticks can be active anytime it's above freezing and we don't have like a thick snowpack. Um, you know, obviously in a day like today, probably not a problem, but, um, you know, really spring through late fall, we we can be exposed to ticks at any point in time. So one of the best things you can do is wear light colored clothing, not because the ticks are less likely to crawl on you, but because you'll be more likely to see them. So if you have one of those tiny little poppy seed size black legged tick nymphs and you're wearing dark jeans and a black t-shirt, forget it. Like you'll never see that on yourself. I mean, you'd have to have incredible eyesight. Um, of course, wearing insect repellent works really well. Um, deep woods off is effective. And I know it's not like the most fashionable thing you can do, but if you tuck your pants into your socks, um, that's a great way to keep ticks from crawling up your legs. And so basically what that does, if you do encounter any ticks, they're going to stay on the outside of your clothing for longer, um, as opposed to crawling up your leg where they, they might be able to um, bite you and latch on before you can get home and shower. Um, there's a number of different products on the market that you can use to try to um, keep ticks off of you as well. I know a lot of people don't love spraying themselves with like insect repellent every single day. Um, so there's different products you can use to treat your clothing. So it's kind of you do it once and then it lasts for so many washings. Um, if you don't want to treat your own clothing, there is um, companies out there, um, Insect Shield, that you can mail your clothing and they will treat them and mail them back or you can buy things at sporting goods store um, clothes that are pre-treated. Um, another really great thing that I've worn out in the field are these tick gaiters and basically what these are are um, it's mesh that velcros around your leg and it's impregnated with um, an insect or insecticide and this mesh is sort of interesting or attractive to the ticks so when they crawl up your leg they hit that mesh and instead of continuing to crawl up they spend more time in the mesh and because they're spending time in that mesh um, they're encountering the insecticide and then they're dying before they can continue crawling up on your body and finding a place to bite you so just a little anecdotal evidence i went out last summer with one of my coworkers, and i forgot my tick gaiters and my coworker had zero ticks on herself. She was wearing hers. And I had probably, oh, I don't even know, maybe 15 ticks I had pulled off throughout the course of the day. So anecdotally, I find that they work pretty good. It's definitely something to consider. <clears throat> and then in terms of land management strategies, like I said, we are working on um, coming up with more land management strategies you can use to reduce your tick risks. But if you're just thinking about your property, um, what do ticks like? They like high humidity. They really like um, a dense undergrowth. So if you have invasive plants, that's very um, hospitable to ticks. They're also relying on these large host populations, so particularly rodents um, and deer as well. And things like yard debris. So I, I will admit this is a picture of my own yard. Um, we did some cleanup and then it sat there for about a year. And this is sort of prime uh, rodent habitat. It's, it's sheltered and protected. And so finally I was like, oh gosh, I have to get this out of my yard because you know, I'm all I'm doing is encouraging the rodents and the tick population, and you know, I don't need that either. Um, ticks, uh, they don't like drier environments. So if you're in a coniferous forest, you may be at lower risk for tick, though they're definitely still there and they're, it's not a no risk situation. Um, also, removing invasive plants is probably one of the best things you can do to reduce your tick risk in your own property. Um, think about reducing mouse habitat. So those stick piles that you have on the edge of your yard, um, and then reducing any spilled feed or grain. And so if you have bird feeders, those are great. I love having them out too. Um, just try to use ones that either uh, don't have as much waste, so aren't spilling as much of the seed, or you can even buy these, um, these little trays that go under bird feeders and they catch any spilled seed. So that way the seed isn't hitting the ground and you're not just feeding a large mouse population. Um, and then lastly, if you, and live in the woods like so many of us, um, you know, and you go to rake your leaves in the fall. A lot of times we just kind of want to rake it to the edge of the wood line. Um, and there have been studies that have shown that that really creates sort of optimal tick habitat. So either just mulch your leaves in place um, or try to remove them, but don't try to create that nice dense leafy layer right at the kind of edge between your lawn and the woods. Um, so those are just some things you can keep in mind when you're trying to think about ways to reduce your own tick-borne disease risk. And of course, 
probably the most important thing is check yourself for ticks after you've been outside. There's a lot of really great tick resources out there um, here in Maine. Um, if you can look at the Maine Department of Health and Human Services, they have a lot of really great information on vector-borne diseases. The Maine Cooperative Extension has a wonderful program here in Orono where they will test ticks for the people of Maine. So if you find a tick on yourself or a family member or a pet, you can send it to Cooperative Extension and they'll identify that tick for you for free. And if you want to have it tested for pathogens, um, you can have that done for $15 a tick, which is much cheaper than um, most other states. And they also have a lot of really great information on their website about ticks. And you can even go on their website and look at real time data of um, the number of ticks that have been submitted in your town and what pathogens they're carrying in your town as well. And if you really want to get a nice deep um, overview of Lyme disease and the black legged ticks, um, there's a great book called Lyme disease, the ecology of a complex system. And that really will just kind of drive home why this is such a tough problem to, to deal with and why things are so complex and there's no easy answer for managing ticks. So um, with that, thank you. And um, I'm happy to take any questions. That was great, Alyssa. Thank you so much. So yeah, if anybody has any questions, they can just pipe up. Do tick tubes work? Yeah, those are interesting. So there has been some some research that have suggested they do and others suggested they don't. I don't think it hurts anything. So tick tubes, if people aren't familiar, um, they're usually a tube that's filled with like a bedding or a cotton that rodents would then take and line their nests with. Um, and so then this this cotton or bedding is impregnated with some kind of insecticide. So then when the mice takes it back to their nest, um, the idea is that it, it kills any ticks on the mouse. So I mean, it definitely will kill ticks. Is it going to kill it enough? And will it will enough rodents encounter them to actually have a really large measurable impact? No, I don't think that would be like the one solution that would work, but it it would not hurt as well. There is a question in the chat asking, will the tick the the force tick survey have funding to cover Piscataquis County this year? So not this year. I will say we are looking at expanding um, the program in future years. So um, you can follow our website, um, umaine.edu slash forest tick survey. And we are hoping to include Wiscatoxus County and some of the other counties in Maine. Yeah, this, the first two years we really just focused on southern coastal Maine just because those had the densest tick populations. Um, but yeah, we would like to expand in the future. All right, I don't see any other questions. Did anyone, if anyone had any last minute questions for either Alyssa about ticks or Tom about brown tail or emerald ash borer? Hey, this is Seth Jones, uh, DC here in Piscataquis. And I hear a lot of people say that they think that turkeys are a big problem with, with moving ticks around. Is that? True, not true. Do they go after fowl? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, no, I, I would not say turkeys are, are bad or they're not increasing a tick population. So it's so funny. I hear two things. Some people say um, turkeys are great at reducing tick populations. And I've also heard that turkeys are increasing the tick population and they're probably not doing either one. Um, so the thought is. Birds definitely move ticks. So ticks are not moving themselves. So they're relying on um, migratory birds, um, deer, other wildlife that move because they move much further than they will. Um, and, and ticks will definitely feed on turkeys and turkeys will sometimes groom the ticks off themselves. So I think that's why people think they're you know good for the tick population. But there's there's really no birds that are that are out there that are actively seeking out and eating the ticks. Um, 
so unfortunately, no, it's not like the turkeys or even the guineas. I know people think that guineas may be good for their tick populations, but the research just hasn't shown that to be true. Thank you. All right, I don't see any other questions. So we are at 119 and if everybody is, um, of course, what I can do is I can share contact information with our listserv um, along with the recording to everybody joining us so that if they do have follow-up questions for either Alyssa or Tom, they can send um, them, uh, contact them via email and I'll send the, the web links and, and various things like that. Uh, thank you again, Alyssa, and thank you, Tom, for joining us and for presenting. And I hope everybody, um, I, I know I learned a ton and I'm kind of cr crawling out of my skin a little <laughs> bit, but <laughs> it's all good. But thank you, everybody, for joining us, and I'll go ahead and, and end the meeting. Great. Thanks for having us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. You too.